everyone. Welcome back to Book Talks with the blog Latinx is in Kidlet. I am Dr. Chris Rhodes. This is Dr. Sonia Alejandra Rodriguez. Um, and we both are really excited today to talk about the Pura Belpre award-winning book, Esperanza Rising. This book came out 21 years ago, which is kind of odd to think about. Uh, came out in 2000, won the Pura Belpre award in 2002. Um, and it really is a huge touchstone for Latinx youth literature. And so we think it's important to talk about as we are continuing this video series and uh, talking through books that we, we think are really important for us. Um, so I think just to get us started, Sonia, if uh, we, were, we were talking before we started recording that this book is so important and so impactful in a lot of different ways because of the history that it represents. It takes place in the 1930s, post-Mexican Revolution, Dust Bowl era kind of California, um, but it also has a contemporary exigency with the way that it depicts activism. Um, so I think that's something that I would really love to talk about with you, the way that this book is some feels so now, right? Like I just said, it was published 21 years ago and it takes place in the 30s, but you know, it's a book that I think really speaks to, to youth readers now. I agree. Also, 20 years ago, wow. I was one? No. <laughs> <laughs> I know, me too. I was a wee babe. <laughs> yeah, wow, yeah, 20 years ago. That's so amazing. I think, I think this was one of the first books that I, that I read that introduced me to Latinx um, kid, kid lit, right? Children's and young adult literature um, when I was in graduate school. So yeah, it's definitely been part of like my trajectory to thinking about Latinx kid lit and how much it has evolved. And I just listened, I just finished listening to the audiobook of Esperanza Rising. And you're right, like it's still so like reminiscent and present of the times, right? Even though it takes place, it's a historical fiction novel, right? Even though it takes place in the 1930s with the repatriation and like like the deportation, right, of like Mexicans, Mexican nationals and uh, Mexican right. citizens or citizens yeah. who are Mexican ancestry, right, in the United well, States. US citizens, yeah, that's... Yeah, the, and the, it's, it's like, wow. I was thinking about like what you're saying about the activism and the character Marta really stood out to me because I feel like, and I mean, I don't have a prof professional way of saying it. She got a lot of shade <laughs> in the book. She did. She I did. was like, that's so interesting. Mm hmm Yeah, she's, she's always the character that I think stands out to me the most, and part of it is my mom is Martha, that's my mom's name, um, and so every time I read it, I, I think, oh, my mom, but uh, she's so fascinating because they regard her with such disdain because she jeopardizes them, right? She puts a kind of a target on their backs because she's revealing the atrocious working conditions that they have. She's speaking the truth about these deportations, like you were saying, that it wasn't just immigrants, it was people who were U.S. citizens of Mexican descent or, um, you know, whose parents were, were from Mexico but were born here, were being sent to Mexico. You know, it's just galling to think about. And so Marta really reveals these horrors and is is completely shunned for it. Um, but I do think that she's such an important character and Esperanza's regard for her in this book, right? Esperanza is like, I agree with what Martha is saying, but I can't do anything to, to help her because I don't want to jeopardize, um, you know, her Esperanza's mom gets sick and they're trying to get Abuela to the U.S. And yeah. so Esperanza is so torn about all of this. But I really just kind of want to jump into the book myself and like go stand with Martha and you know, be be loud and vocal. Like yeah. I just think such a fascinating character. I was similarly. I was trying to think of like what is the purpose of that tension, right? Of of that shade. We're just gonna like it because it's real. Like there's a lot of antagonism, right? Rooted in fear. And the best that I could come up with to explain it to myself because no one else was asking, right? But to explain it to myself was um, it's, it's um, Munoz does a really good job of creating that tension between like citizens and undocumented people, right? And migrants. And so they might have a shared like culture, right? Shared stories, experiences in Mexico, right? But it's just like that, a different privilege of citizenship, 
right? And who can speak up and who is protected, uh, assumingly so, right? Because, right, Mexican uh, citizens, citizens are getting deported as well. Yeah. I think was represented very well with Marta, right? That yeah. she does have this like supposed privilege in the U.S. because of citizenship and has this goal to like speak, but then there's that really sad moment where she needs to hide, mm -hmm. right, in the book. Yeah. Yeah, and Esperanza, I love that moment where, like, Esperanza goes into the back of the packing shed, and Marta is there, and she gives her, like, a thing of asparagus and an apron and says, go. And so it's this, this moment where Esperanza gets to resist in some small measure, but it does, like, that, that scene always kind of breaks my heart a little bit, um, because I, I see, I can kind of empathize with the fact that Martha might view that as a failure for her activism. Um, but she also, you know, a part of being an activist, and this is um, one of the things that I think about um, with my own activism, is part of being an activist is also like taking care of yourself um, and, you know, making sure that uh, you are safe and able to continue with the cause and continue with the fight. Um, and that's what Martha does in this moment, right? It's, it's a kind of a push and pull. When do you stand down and when do you stand up? Um, and that is, that's such a, a heartbreaking scene where, where Martha hides and is saved. Yeah, and I also just think about, like, these are, <laughs> they're children, right? They're children right. standing up to, like, systemic oppression, systemic, like, racism, right? Because the reason that the raid happened was because, like, the farm owners called, right, immigration to collect, right, the, the strikers, right, and so Esperanza is like, what, 12 in the book, 11, 12, I think. right, and so they're, they're both, and Marta, I think, is like, in, she's a teenager, right, but they're, yeah, right, and so, like, these children are put in these situations, right, where they, they're the ones that need to stand up to, like, like, big monsters, like, big, like, oppressive, like, forces, mm -hmm. right, um, and then our, it, it feels so traumatizing, right? And it feels, I mean, there's agency, but it's just, at that moment, I was like, oh no, Marta, let me just, yeah, it was rough. It is, it is rough. And she, she's such a, she is such a fighter. Like, I love, there's a line in the book where um, they say that Marta's dad died in the Mexican Revolution, but she carries his revolutionary spirit. Um, and I love that, that, and because Esperanza's own dad has, was killed, um, and in a quite a kind of tragic sort of novella sort of way by his, you know, own brothers there, but, um, it, it, it is really poignant that these two characters who have sort of this shared background of familial trauma, um, and the, their resistance manifests in really different, radically different ways. Um, and they both stand up in the ways that they can, right? We get these sort of divergent perspectives of what it means to be an activist and what it means to be resistant to these huge, like, monstrous forces at play. Um, and I, the thing that always galls me about this book is, right, it's the, these farmers, like you said, it's the farmers who call immigration. Uh, and to get rid of their own laborers. Well, they're, you know, to be fair, they're striking, so they're not working at the time. But, um, you know, it's this sort of disposability of um, humans that just always strikes me when I read this book. Right, which we, we continue to see throughout history, even up to the present, right, in, in terms when it comes to, like, uh, migrants, like Mexican, Filipinos, right, and other, like, ethnicities who are working, like, the field work, and like in factories and in all sorts of places, right? That like, right, as soon as they become disposable or, right, let's just call ICE, right? Or INS or at the time or whatever. Whoever else it was, La Migra, whoever. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, I, that's the, uh, when I write about this book and um, do my research on this book, one of the things that I um, pay attention to is not just the child labor in this book, right, because Esperanza performs older, she like braids her hair so she looks more adult, so they'll hire her in the packing sheds, um, right, but also how foreign labor is, a, a, you know, 
commerce at, was commerce at this time, um, you know, in post World War One, Dust Bowl. Uh, these were people that that need to be paid um, really at all. And knowing how that has not changed, thinking about you know how farm workers are are paid a pittance now um, is just you know, it's a lot, right? If we think about like the um, Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta and their activism, it's still, it's still relevant. It's still, you know, a hundred years removed from when this book takes place um, and 50 or 60 from um, Chavez and Huerta, right? It's, it's still the same. We're still in these same sort of horrible conditions for people. And it's absolutely just awful, awful. Yeah, I think that was something that I was thinking about and that I appreciated about Munoz's book. Um, uh, that it talks about, like, it's farm workers, like farm worker movement before Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta, mm -hmm. right? That, like, our country recognizes that history, right? That it starts with Cesar, Ch Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta when it didn't, yeah. right? And so I like that there is a book. Say it again starts with Marta. Yeah, right, that, that it started way before, right, and so, and, and, right, our, our country and our history has, we like idols, right, and so when we create idols, right, we sort of tend to forget, like, that there was other folks before them, and so I like that this book really does talk about that, the, that this unionizing of, like, the farm workers, or that um, the mistreatment, the neglect, the rising up was happening before then, right, and that it was a long build-up, Right, that it didn't just happen overnight and that it continues to be a struggle now. Right? It's not something that was like in history and past and we got over it. Right. We haven't, right. As, as you said. Right. Yeah. I think that's one of the interesting things, like when I reread this book or when I teach this book um, with students, because this is a history that off people don't often know. Um, right. We, we get a really whitewashed history when we're in school. So we know sort of what happened in the 1930s through today, but we don't know what happened to non-white people at those times. Um, and so teaching this book and thinking about this book, like thinking about Mexican repatriation, thinking about migrant activism, um, unionizing, you know, before uh, Chavez and Huerta and LULAC and those kinds of things, um, you know, these are histories that are forgotten, that are, and not just forgotten, they're actively forgotten, they're pushed to the side. Um, and so having a book like this that so radically foregrounds that is one of the things that I think is re really stands out to me um, when I think about this book and when I think that it was published at a time when so few uh, Latinx children's books were being published or really were being um, promoted and, and widely read. Like this book is fairly widely read in terms yeah. of um, Latinx children's literature. I think this is typically the one um, when I talk to my students, they're like, oh, I've read that one. I read that one in school, um, whereas they haven't heard of some of the others. So I think, you know, kind of its traction is really good because it does reveal these, um, these erased histories. Yeah, I think also simi uh, similarly what I was thinking about this book that I don't think I caught the first time that I read it um, when it first came out is the mention of Esperanza Spanish uh, ancestry, right? And is Miguel, is Miguel the, the counterpart? The... Miguel, yeah, Miguel is the their indigenous servant boy. Yeah, and so, yeah, so Miguel has this, like, wonderful line about, like, like, for people like me, right, for, like, the indigenous servants or for the servants, right, mobility was not an option in this country, right, in, in Mexico, right? That And he points out to Esperanza that her whiteness, right, her Spanish ancestry protected her, mm -hmm. right, and, and that's like a harsh reality for us, for little Espanza, right, in the United States, right, because she's a child, and I mean, privileged, and don't understand that, and so I found that moment, like, super powerful that I, just, I did not catch the first time that I read it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a, I, I, there's sort of a callback in the beginning of the book, Miguel, tells her that she's the fairest of the land and then at the end of the book when they're not allowed in the uh oh that's the right pool, the okizard she she uh, parrots that phrase back to him that they're not um and I always think this is an interesting moment and it's something that I I'm always 
try to be really conscious to say that Esperanza is a white character. She is Spanish. She is uh, from of Spanish descent. She, yes, she was born in Mexico, but the, you know, it, Mexico is a colonial country, uh, and okay. there are I know there are white people, indigenous people, Asian people, right, black, black people, people who are who are all Mexican, um, and it's it's you know diverse, and so uh, you know grappling with Esperanza's whiteness and how that sort of um, passed over because she gets clumped in with all of the other Mexicans um, and the sort of contours of that diversity are just completely erased for for them. They're all oppressed of the United States and this is something that Esperanza really has to grapple with because she's rich, she was rich in Mexico. She you know was educated which is a really anomalous thing. She went to school um, and, and so thinking about this privilege that she has and also, you know, talking about what it means to be a white Latina and a lot of, uh, a lot of people who I think are probably not Latinx really struggle with understanding that there can be white Latinxes and they're definitely, I'm a white Latina. Like it's, you know, just because I have dark hair doesn't mean that, that I'm a person of color, right? That um, matrices of oppression are, are building and uh, intersectional. And so uh, that is one of the really striking things for me about this book too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think that's something that like when I teach, like students also struggle with, um, like understanding that oppression and privilege can exist in the same body, right? Mm -hmm. That like you could have both. Um, and I was just like, tell them, right? Like you sitting in the classroom right now is a privilege, mm -hmm. right? Even though you have to pay for it, you, know, you probably have to work like multiple jobs to, to, to be here and you still have all these responsibilities. Like just the fact of sitting in a classroom is an act, is a privileged act. Um, but, but I think you're right, right? And that conversation of Esperanza being a white Latina does not happen a lot, right? It needs to happen a lot more. Um, but I think you're right that it just gets super complicated that just folks are like, we're not going to engage, it's diverse. Yep, yep. We're just going to call it diverse. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and that I, I guess I'm I'm glad when people are reading any Latinx book, um, but it, this is sort of like a gateway, I think, where I'm like, here, read the white Latinx book, and then we're gonna go get Elizabeth Acevedo and <laughs> read that and kind of get them, jump them in in that way. That you know, uh, these books represent the the huge diversity of what it means to be Latinx. Um, and I think that's really important that we we do not view this as a monolith. That uh, what is that great TED talk? The danger of a single story, right? We we don't fall into that trap. And I think that um, really focusing on some of the more specifics in this book help us to to facilitate those conversations. Yeah, there's so much to like discuss about this book that again I hadn't remembered because I was so little when this book came out. I was so young. Yeah, just a baby. <laughs> so, I was so young when this book came out. Um, but I was thinking about the purpose of, of land, right, in this book, because it, there's like echoes of what you said about like the Mexican Revolution, and the Mexican Revolution was like a fight over land, right? And and in the book starts out that there is struggle over um, Esperanza, was the the rose farm farm ranch yeah. rose or something? Oh, I forget yeah. what it's called. Sounds like like Shit's Creek, like El uh, uh, Rancho. Mm. <laughs> yes, yeah, some, something like that, right? Like there's a rose yeah. something in there. We've read yeah. this book, um, yeah. but the struggle, right, and one of the reasons, I think the reason that the, the dad dies, right, is because there's still this tension over land, yeah. right, um, and who owns the land, right? It's not the indigenous people who own the land, right? It's the ranchers who are often white, right? And then, right, we see that um, mentioned again, right? It was, a Mar you said it was Marta's father who, who died, in right, in the Mexican yeah. Revolution, and we see that fight for land with the migrants in the U.S., Right, they're, they're working, tilling the land, growing the land, mm -hmm. and there's still no respect for that, right? And even if we want to get more complicated, right, that like it was Mexico before, but then the Mexicans took it from the indigenous people. And so, like, it's so many layers, right? But there's such fight for land represented mm -hmm. in this book and so many layers of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. The uh, thinking about right these these ranch owners and this is something that always strikes me about this book because that's really similar to how my family came to the U.S. They came right around the time that Esperanza's family does um, because they owned ranch land and then lost it 
uh, after the, during the Mexican Revolution. So they picked up and moved to Texas. Um, but uh, I think there's, there's these really great passages in this book where Esperanza, before her father is killed, Esperanza's father tells her to put her ear to the ground and hear the heartbeat of the land. Um, and then when she gets to California, she has this panic attack because she can't hear the heartbeat anymore. Um, and so when I read that, I read that as this land is living, this land is alive and has then been killed, right? In, in many ways has been um, rendered, rendered hostile in many ways and rendered hostile because of this sort of these, what you're saying, like these layers of occupation and um, how this land is indigenous land. Um, and that's really important to acknowledge that, you know, this land was colonized um, yeah. and there are always going to be land disputes and they're going to fall to the, the ways that dominant powers, colonial powers abuse the land and abuse the people who occupy that land. Yeah, I like that phrase, layers of occupation. Right, because that's, I feel like that's so true with just like Mexican history and like what a lot of like Chicano studies call like Aslan and mm -hmm. the Southwest in the US, right? There's so many layers of occupation. Just interesting. I think before we end, I think we need, we need to talk about Esperanza's mom's illness. Yes, her, her valley fever. Um, Which I did not know was a thing, but, I, and, and I'm not surprised, right? There's so much like illnesses caused in the in these fields because of the pesticides because of just poor working conditions um and it's just so like hard it happened right away it was just, like first day of the job and there was this like dust storm and she was mm -hmm. the mom was ill for months mm -hmm. right and Esperanza was left to take care of herself for a long time yeah yeah and she you know she when she sees her mom in the hospital and has this sort of moment of this doesn't look like my mom um, and she braids her hair to try to kind of reclaim this um, and I think it is it's one of the things that I do also think kind of connects to um, why this book I think is still really contemporary contemporarily relevant um, you know with thinking about disease and illness I mean we're recording this on zoom in <laughs> the middle of a pandemic uh and there are still migrant workers still um you know u.s citizen workers in the fields now to feed people who are watching this video to feed me um and you know thinking about the fact that they're they're risking disease they're risking this you know deadly virus um at the same time that you know 100 years ago esperanza's mother and people real people like her, because she's fictional, but uh, real people like her uh, risked life and limb to, to do this work and um, that makes Esperanza have to grow up really quickly. And she's this child who grew up with such immense privilege and then suddenly both of her parents are gone and she's in this new land and doesn't know how to cope um, and has to have a job. And it, it's a lot for her. I think that this is one of the, one of the things that oftentimes when people read this book, I think they struggle with that this is child labor. And um, we, we really, we really, you know, go against this, but she has to, she doesn't have a choice. Her mom is sick and she wants to take care of her mom. Yeah. And I think like the, the not having a choice, right, is so prevalent throughout this book. Yes, we want rights. Yes, we want protection. Yes, we want all of these things. Who does not want all of these like protections and privileges and benefits, but right, we don't have a choice. We, there's yeah. we need to put food on the table right and so many of the characters say that in the book right that like we have to work because i need to feed my children right or i need to work because i need to bring grandma or i need to work right and i think that's very easy to happen with that next kid live to forget that these are children that they are 12 yeah. years old yes yeah i think you know um having having esperanza have these immense responsibilities is something that is really difficult to grapple with. I often ask my students, who gets to be a child? Right? Um, and that's a really tough question. Who, who gets to have a childhood? Um, in a lot of uh, Latinx children's literature, we, we see these, these young people often don't get childhoods. And it's not fictionalized. This is very real. Um, we get adultification of black and brown children 
throughout time in the 1930s and in 2021. And it's a lot, but I think, you know, as we, we come to a close with this video, I think what we want to do is really push our readers, people who are reading these books and, and thinking through these concepts with us, we really want to push them to grapple with the idea that these are children and yet they're still facing these immense odds and you know we get great endings where mama comes back and abuela is you know gets to come to the u.s and everyone's together and they have that big quilt that esperanza has been crocheting and um it's beautiful and lovely but not everything ends beautiful and lovely um and i think what we want to make sure and what we do as um, people who, who write for this blog and who make these videos is really try to promote those stories um, that show all of these perspectives and um, show children thriving, but also show children just surviving um, because yeah. that's what reality is. Yeah, and I think that's a change we've been seeing like throughout since that book, since Espinosa Rising came out, right? That like the Latinx pillared books that are coming out now are challenging this like happy ending. Mm -hmm. Right, that they're not wrapping everything up in a bow and be like, solved. Yeah, we were talking about um, Aida Salazar's Land of the Cranes um, and how, how that book kind of, we think, connects really well with, with Esperanza Rising. So um, yeah. we might encourage people to read both of these um, and report back to us and tell us your <laughs> thoughts on how they connect. I would really love to uh, see that, you know, tweet at the Latinx Kidlet uh, account and we would love to see your thoughts on that. All right, thank you for, for this talk and this conversation. All right, bye everyone.